Hello, I'm Hannah Vaughan-Jones. Welcome to Together Caring for Rare Disease, a programme by Genetic Alliance UK and ITN Business. Rare conditions are often lifelong and complex, and as a result, patients and their families need care from a range of different services. And it's the coordination of that care that can make all the difference. In this report for Genetic Alliance UK, we find out how well-coordinated care has been life-changing for a family of a patient with Alström syndrome. And this is Hassan. Absolutely, yep. yeah. yeah. That's my young man, Hassan. <laughs> Hassan has Elstrom syndrome. He's a young, independent young man, very active in terms of his lifestyle, loves the outdoors, loves cycling, loves going to the gym. This rare genetic condition has deprived Hassan of sight and a normal life expectancy. He was diagnosed with Alstrom syndrome when he was 17 years old, so that was quite a late diagnosis. Um, but actually from a very young age we sort of felt things weren't right for Hassan. At the age of about 16 he just woke up one morning and said, Dad, everything's quite dark, I can't see anything. This is one of these really rare conditions. It affects about one in a million people altogether. Children are often born healthy and well, but by the age of about six weeks, they get wobbly eyes noticed by their parents. And on vision testing, it finds that they've got a severe vision defect. About a third of these children then develop heart failure in the first three months of life. And sadly, some of them don't survive from this. But those that do then go on to develop a particular pattern of features that includes early onset obesity, hearing problems, vision loss leading to blindness altogether, and a range of other health Health illnesses that means they're very dependent on hospital services. They ended up having to go to one hospital for an eye doctor, another hospital to a hearing doctor, someone else for a heart doctor. It was just very, very hard for them. So we set up this service called a one-stop shop where all of the hospital specialists would come together on one or two days for the families to come and see all the specialists together in one, in one occasion. That's what happens here in Birmingham, where Hassan and his family meet all of the clinicians helping to manage his condition. From a carer's perspective, having a team who you've got direct contact with takes the burden off completely. Because if I've got a challenge in, with my local clinicians around a repeat prescription, for example, and the clinicians communicate with each other and the connection is made very quickly, this approach to treatment, called care coordination, helps clinicians work more closely together, reducing the risk of medicines prescribed by one causing problems for another. The example at the moment that works really well is a, a young person comes up and they're getting bad headaches and somebody wants to prescribe them a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug but the kidney doctor is there and says well please don't do that because they've got kidney problems and that would harm that. Care coordination also brings families together and helps them to share experiences. Because it's so rare, uh, families from around the country don't know anybody else with the condition. So bringing everybody together with an opportunity uh, allows the families to actually give each other peer support. Uh, we try and age ban them so that children under 10 are all seen together and then teenagers are seen together. And I think the families get a lot of, a lot of emotional support from that. In terms of the complexity of the condition and what that means in terms of day-to-day -day impact around need, around care, all of a sudden you add this tribe of people behind you who are endorsing in what, what is required in terms of that care package. So it's been really positive. And working together raises awareness and improves understanding, leading to better outcomes for patients and their families. What I can say is that uh, since the clinics were started in 2008, children are now graduating to adulthood in a much healthier state than they would have done 20, 30 years ago. So I think I feel very hopeful for the future because of the better coordination that we have. This is a very progressive condition. We've had conversations with clinicians about life expectancy, which are very difficult to have. However, because I believe in my faith, death is inevitable for us all. And I don't really look, I take, we take each day as it comes in the most positive way as possible. And care coordination is certainly helping Hassan and those like him with rare conditions make the most of every moment 
and enjoy family life. Coordinating care is the theme of Rare Disease Day 2023. To find out why it's so important for patients of rare conditions, I'm joined by Louise Fish, the Chief Executive of Genetic Alliance UK. Louise, great to have you here with us. First, though, um, I want to start by saying that this isn't the first time that ITM Business has collaborated with Genetic uh, Alliance UK. Last year, we produced a film for you specifically highlighting how important it is for early intervention uh, for babies born with spinal muscular atrophy. The film itself is both heart breaking and heartwarming uh, in equal measure. And we aren't the only ones who think so. The film has been nominated for two awards, and I'm delighted to say that it's won bronze in the healthcare and pharmaceutical sector uh, for the Lens Awards. So tell us a little bit more about this film. Well, we're really grateful to Ezra and his family for sharing their story. And as you say, it's heartbreaking, but it's heartbreaking most of all because it's a situation that could have been avoided. So the UK um, screens every newborn baby through the newborn blood spot heel prick test. Um, and at the moment in the UK, we just screen for nine conditions, but across many European countries, we screen, they screen for up to 20 conditions. Um, and spinal muscular atrophy is one of those conditions. Uh, if it's screened for early and picked up early, then there's a new treatment available. And that treatment, if given quickly, means that there isn't the irreversible ne motor neuron damage that, that, that causes the kind of challenges that we see in the film with, with Ezra. Yeah, and Ezra is very much the star of this film. So let's Absolutely. just take a little look now at um, part of the film where we're first introduced to Ezra. Ezra struggles with many of the things most people take completely for granted. Breathing, eating, even holding up the weight of his own body. But he's one of the first generation of SMA type 1 kids to make it beyond infancy. Well, SMA is just one of many rare uh, conditions that Genetic Alliance UK support. There are so many others as well that are lifelong and complex. Getting a diagnosis is clearly a challenge, but there are other major challenges as well. Absolutely. As you said, these conditions are lifelong and complex. And what that means is people need to see lots of different health professionals on a really regular basis to get the support they need. And that can range from the GPs that we all see through hospital specialists, specialist nurses, occupational health specialists, specialists, physiotherapists, speech and language therapists, and in some cases, learning disability nurses. So it's a really wide range of professionals, and that means a lots of appointments on lots of different dates in lots of different places, and it's a real juggle for families to cope with all of it. It sounds like multiple appointments as well. Absolutely, multiple appointments across different um, hospital settings on different dates, and it's a real, real challenge and a juggle for families. Especially, of course, for families with school-aged children as well. Absolutely. So, you know, parents will be taking time off from their jobs to take their kids to appointments, and kids will be missing school, which is a nightmare both in terms of their education, but also just socially in terms of their friends and missing out on those, those friendships which are so important for, for all children. Well, effective coordination of care clearly has so many benefits, as you've just described, but our health service is under so much pressure at the moment. Is coordinated care something that is feasible, that we can really see happening? Well, it should be, because it makes a huge difference, not only to the families that um, get better coordinated care, but also to the health professionals providing that care, who are able to work together much more effectively and provide the much better care that we know they want to. But at the moment, um, most recent findings have shown that only one out of 10 people with a rare condition is receiving any support with their care coordination. So it's, it's something we really need to tackle uh, and it will benefit both families and the health service. Well, well done with the campaign. We wish you all the best. Louise Fish, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. To successfully deliver life-changing medicines, it is crucial that patients are treated as equal partners in the planning and delivery of clinical development programs. Bionicle EMAS are working with patient advocacy groups to ensure patients' voices are heard and that programs are specifically tailored to the needs of each rare disease community. Living with a rare disease is stressful. And I'm hoping to go home this morning. Lara Bloom has Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which damages her connective tissues and necessitates frequent hospital visits. There's currently no cure or effective treatment for EDS, but Lara believes that involving patients in every stage of clinical development gives the best hope of a breakthrough. 
Patients need to be involved from the very beginning right through to the end because they're the narrative, they're the experience, they're the why. And without that, then you're not going to get a really effective trial, research study, any form of process really. It's about your lived experience. That's what nobody else around the table can provide. And that is what the patient, the person's voice brings. And they're more than a patient. They're a husband, they're a wife, they're a parent, they're a sibling, they're a partner. They work, they may study, and that's what needs to come. Engaging with patients as equal partners and with specialized teams working in rare diseases, Bionicle EMAS is a clinical research organization supporting global medical innovation by ensuring that the lived experience of those with rare conditions helps to co-design the research to treat them. Working with leading biotech and pharma companies worldwide, Bionicle EMAS bring life-changing medicines to patients through clinical development, early access programs and clinical trial supply, making sure that engagement with patients is far more than a tick box exercise. The rare disease team are made up of, of global patient advocacy and rare disease insight specialists and they really drive our patient centricity. They engage with the patient community and they work to understand the individual conditions that we're working with so that we can really truly understand the different nuances of those conditions and the challenges that the patients and the families face. And the more that we can bring their voice in as a key stakeholder in terms of understanding you know, what they're going through, what, what support they might need, then, then all of that goes towards raising awareness around the need to do more to bring life-changing medicines to them. Bionicle EMAS say that when setting up clinical development programs, patient involvement should be early, often and transparent, with two-way feedback to ensure mutual understanding. Leading the global patient advocacy team, Naomi Litchfield's own experience of having a sister with a rare condition has made her passionate about giving a voice to patients and their families. I've cared for many of these families and really understand the challenges that they live with every day and how hard it is. It's really hard. So I'm compelled to speak up for them and to support them and make sure that other people are listening. Once we've listened and learned and they've commented, what are we going to do with that information? We're going to take it on board and this is what we've amended, this is what we've done with that information and now it's so important to feed that back to them and say this is what we've learned from you, thank you for your time, this is how valuable you are. My name is Lara Bloom. As a professor of patient engagement at a US university, Lara teaches a new generation of medical students about the importance of involving patients as key and equal stakeholders who truly make a difference. The most satisfying thing that you can see when your, your input changes things is often when it's to do with the lived experience of symptom management, something that people may not have thought about but really impacts your day-to-day -day and would make a difference in your quality of life. Learning from that personal experience will create better outcomes and brighter futures for those living with rare diseases. An education gap in rare disease training can leave many doctors underprepared when faced with a patient who has an unfamiliar condition. Medscape Education Global is working with medics for rare diseases to advocate for a single discipline approach to rare disease education. Dr Lucy Mackay is giving a lecture at Queen Mary University London about rare diseases. What we do is take an all rare disease approach instead of going into lots of detail about a few. Her brother died from a rare condition. Later, as a medical student here at Barts, she saw there was an education gap. So she founded a charity to teach medical students that rare diseases are not as rare as they think, affecting one in 17 people. While each rare disease is rare itself, people with rare conditions are common in as much as there are 3.5 million people in the UK living with a rare condition, which is the equivalent to um, approximately the adult population living with asthma. But at the moment, that patient group isn't considered as one group with its own unique profile of needs, which it very much has. 
Medics for Rare Diseases is working with Medscape, the largest provider of free medical education online, to advocate a single discipline approach to improve innovation and research and the treatment patients receive. We found that uh, physicians are vastly underestimating the prevalence of rare diseases by 50 to 500 fold. Um, so they think, you know, one in a hundred thousand, one in a million, when in fact it's one in two thousand. We know that about five percent of the population has a rare disease, but physicians are saying that they see one or two patients per year, whereas they should be seeing one or two patients a day. What's really important about Medics for Rare Diseases and what Medscape are doing is about if you then have someone with that umbrella label of rare disease, as a clinician, you'll be able to put this idea together of how their life might be impacted, how the family might be impacted, what they might have already been through and what they might go through, but also know where to get resources, know where to go to get support for yourself and for the family. There are over 7,000 rare diseases. The average time to receive an accurate diagnosis is around five years, but can be 10 years or more. Patients are often left to coordinate and manage their own complex medical care plans. There's a huge diagnostic odyssey for families. What I mean by that is that they enter the health system at multiple points, often for years. They spend a median of 68 hospital appointments, that's six years, in and out of the system, not getting a diagnosis. So it's really, really important that the students who graduate from Queen Mary here in our medicine dentistry courses understand how to recognise that. Working with different advocate groups and medical professionals, Medscape has developed a trusted resource centre for rare disease education under one umbrella. It has around 150 different educational activities. So this is where healthcare professionals can come to find out more about rare diseases, isn't it? Exactly. So we start at the very top of the page with patient journeys. It's all about the patient. We want to put the patient front and centre. Dan was born with a very rare medical condition, wyburn mason syndrome, affecting one in 50 million people. It left him completely blind in one eye. Later in life, he discovered he has another rare disease which affects his growth hormones, leading to enlarged features, hands and feet. He was diagnosed after two years, but others are not so lucky. The quicker, the better for diagnosis. And uh, some people may not be diagnosed for 10, 15, 20 years. And that can have a huge impact on your growth of your limbs, your joints and many other things as well. So awareness and early diagnosis is really fundamental. This is a really big burden on families, but the most important thing is the anguish and stress that it causes and potentially the missed weather window to consider a therapeutic intervention, which might be as simple as a diet, some vitamins. Most of them are not expensive, uh, but if we catch the disease earlier, we may be able to reduce disability or avoid it. If we keep building up rare disease as this single term, to encompass 3.5 million new people in the UK and their families, then we're creating a language that means that those families and those clinicians can talk to each other without having to go into the big spiel about what it's like to have a rare disease and what it means. Following many years of scientific research, it's expected that gene therapies may start to become a potential treatment option in the not so distant future. But the process of getting these new types of treatments to the right people could be challenging. We met with Pfizer and other health experts to discuss the opportunities and challenges and hear more about the ways in which our healthcare system could evolve to support sustainable access to these treatments for people living with rare diseases. For patients with rare diseases, care can often involve lifelong treatment that might not address the underlying cause of their conditions. It can have a devastating impact on patients' lives and require significant resources from the NHS. Well, rare conditions are individually rare but collectively common. And in fact, there are around three and a half million people in the UK who are affected by rare conditions. That compares with about 900,000 people living with Alzheimer's disease. So it really gives you an idea of the scale of the problem. 
of those rare conditions, we think about eight out of 10 of them have a genetic origin. So it really does affect a significant number of people who could benefit from better care from the NHS and better treatments being available um, to, to support them. Cell and gene therapies have the potential to improve the lives of patients living with rare genetic diseases. And the UK is home to cutting edge research and development in the field. So what needs to happen to make sure our healthcare systems are able to embrace that work to help those people? Well, we have to recognise that this is a new technology and we are at the beginning of the adoption of a whole new class of therapeutics. That requires change. It requires change in the system. If you want to realise what is an enormous potential, then you actually have to look about at how the whole system works. We believe, uh, and we published this in our blueprint uh, last year, uh, that NICE um, will need to adapt the way it assesses these new types of technologies to make sure we capture the full value of them. Um, secondly, that we'll need different types of payment models uh, so that we can check the outcomes that are promised by these medicines are actually delivered. And then finally, we'll need to make sure that we monitor because these are one-time treatments. Um, and, and so the data infrastructure needs to exist to make sure that we can capture that. To help overcome these challenges, Pfizer wants industry to work with the NHS, patients groups and other stakeholders. It's an idea supported by independent organisations working to advance cell and gene therapies. What is great is that there is strong recognition by all stakeholders of the potential of cell and gene therapy. And what we need to do now is bring everybody together in order to plan and affect the change that's necessary to introduce it. When you say bring everyone together, what would you like to see happen in the near future? I would like to see a coordinated effort along the lines that we've seen in other areas of healthcare need, potentially referring to the COVID-19 efforts, but other technological introductions, where all the stakeholders come together to lay out a plan that they all buy into. Those three kind of voices coming together, the patient voice, government and industry is absolutely vital if we're actually going to develop treatments that will make a real difference. With the UK at the vanguard of cell and gene therapy and potential treatments now starting to become a reality, making progress now is seen as important. We're just at the juncture of things really starting to accelerate. So the timing is critical now to start to establish the task force, uh, to start to establish the, the groups working together. So when we really start to see the gene therapies that we've been waiting for for so long, we're ready for them and then we can make sure that they get to patients. Medical advances and innovation in the field of genetics are beginning to transform the lives of people living with rare diseases. PTC Therapeutics is one of the companies at the forefront of the advances for the past 25 years and has been uncovering the genetic mechanisms behind rare conditions in order to treat their cause and not just their symptoms. Our genes provide the building blocks for exactly who we are. And just like model bricks, even the smallest defect can affect their foundations. Tell me what Duchenne is. Uh, it's like a disability that weakens your muscles a little bit so that you can't walk properly in the later bit. But I don't think I'm that far into it yet. Cormac has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is a neurological uh, muscle wasting condition. It's a progressive pro uh, condition that gradually over time gets worse. So as he's now at 12 and, and the progression's obviously started, he's finding stairs a lot more difficult. He's now got a power wheelchair to get around school. Whilst he could walk, any no knocks or bumps will mean that it would fall to the floor. Although the progression of Cormac's disease is taking its toll, medical advances which enable the development of targeted approaches may help to slow its progress, buying him time and a more active life than previously possible. Everyone hopes for the, the cure, and, re, and then you come to realise, well, it may not be as quick as you hoped, and, it, and it, there may never be a cure in the lifetime of, of your child, but you still 
pushing towards that. But what you're looking for is any kind of improvement. Anything that can either delay, ideally stop, and then improve the condition. If nothing was happening, then there'd be no hope whatsoever. PTC Therapeutics is one of the companies developing advanced gene targeting treatments, which treat the cause of a disease, not just its symptoms. With its roots in academic research, it now employs 1,400 people around the world. A lot of the rare disorders that we tackle are monogenetic disorders, meaning that um, they're a mutation in a gene and that you, if you can fix the underlying cause of that disease, therefore make some of the protein or fix how to do that, you can actually treat the disease. So in our case, being able to tackle the underlying cause of the disease is actually pretty important. What I'm very proud of is that there were new therapies with new mechanisms of action, with new chemical entities in new therapeutic areas. Um, and the, and all, each one of those points are, are what I would call groundbreaking. And improved understanding of the mechanisms behind multiple rare diseases is opening up new possibilities for gene-based treatments. The mere fact that you're working on something that could be a potential treatment where it wasn't before is so important to the community. I knew this early on when we set up PTC. It's like, you're not just setting up a company, you're setting up a cause. But making progress requires healthcare professionals, researchers and patients and their families to continue working together to develop and test the treatments of the future. We are seeing increasing successes of uh, the new generation uh, therapies that uh, target specific genetic mutation. When I started my clinical career, that is now nearly 30 years ago, we would not even need to transition young people to adult care because they would not survive. At the moment, we transition to adult care and more than 90% of people with Duchenne. So I think what we are seeing is that um, the field is progressing because the technology progresses. And it's thanks to the advances being made in gene science that the future for children like Cormac is much more positive than in previous generations. As you say, Cormac's condition is progressive, but day-to-day -day life for your family, how much is that centred around Cormac's condition and how much are you able to kind of almost put it to one side and, and get on with life? It's, it's the same as any other boy. You'll watch, uh, you know, American Ninja on the TV and say, I want to do that. And you're like, really? Um, but he, he doesn't see it as being a limitation. He, he, like all kids of his age, he wants to be a YouTuber. He, he'd love to be a food critic, right? He's got a, a very expensive food taste. So he, he doesn't see it as holding back. He sees no reason why he can't do everything that everyone else does. Oh, I've definitely got this. In the UK, one in 17 of us will be affected with a rare condition over our lifetime. And joining me now to explain how they are raising awareness with the I Am Number 17 campaign are Kate Irving from pharmaceutical company Takeda, along with Zainab Najefi, mother to a son living with a rare disease. So Zainab and Kate, welcome to you both. Zainab, let me start with you. Tell us why raising awareness of rare diseases is so important to you and what brought you to be so involved then in this I Am Number 17 campaign. Thank you so much. So I'm a mum of a child with a rare disease, Adnan. He's got a condition called mucolipidosis type 2. It's also known as eye cell disease. The condition affects less than two in a million. Um, so it's super rare. And when he was first diagnosed, I just felt so lonely. We all felt so lonely. We didn't have any information on it. We did all of our own research. And I, I felt alone, um, so I started sharing about him, sharing our story on social media. Um, and I became involved with the I Am Number 17 campaign. And it felt amazing to be part of a campaign where actually we didn't feel so alone. Um, you know, rare diseases will affect one of us, uh, one in 17 of us in our lifetime. That's a huge number of people. That's 3.5 million people in this country. Um, so it's just raising that awareness and just, you know, 
people need to know that we are here and we want to be heard and seen. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then, Kate, from your perspective with Takeda, tell us why rare diseases and raising awareness of rare, rare diseases is so important to you. Well, I mean, Takeda was founded nearly two and a half centuries ago in Japan, and the founding father's principle was that we should treat the patients that we serve as if they are members of our own family, like our own children. And when you consider people living with rare diseases or caring for, for those people, um, they have a, a need, an urgent need, to accelerate access to the care that they need and the diagnosis in, in time. So the campaign, bringing us up to date, um, has been running for four years now. And um, through the campaign, we're aiming to drive an increased awareness of what it's like to be living with rare conditions, but also to drive for change. Because whilst we appreciate a lot has been done, uh, there's still a lot more that needs to happen. And we really want to work to accelerate that rate of change. And one of the areas of change is in equity as well. And I know that's important to you, Zainab. So tell us why equity of care is so pivotal to you in your life. Well, it, it comes down to, again, being so rare, there not being enough awareness. And it, it means that people just give us more attention, really, give you know, my child more attention, give people living with rare diseases more attention, um, equal attention to those conditions that people will have heard of. Um, you know, there's so much that's being done, but so much more that needs to be done as well. So, Kate, raising awareness is obviously important, but also improving education for healthcare professionals. That's important for Takeda as well. It really is. Um, and obviously, it's impossible for every healthcare professional to know about every single rare disease. But there are signs that you can spot. And knowing how and when to refer for specialist attention is absolutely critical. And it should be noted that in the rare disease framework of 2021, it was highlighted that we need to increase healthcare, healthcare professionals' awareness of rare disease. But we think that it actually should be mandatory for medical students and junior doctors to actually have that part of their learning. And Medics for Rare Disease who are partnering with us in our latest wave, our fourth wave of the I Am Number 17 campaign, are really spearheading this drive to, to include awareness of rare diseases and understanding of what to do when you see one or what you think might be one in medical education. And finally, Zainab, as a mother of a child with a rare disease, why is coordination of care so important to you? How would that improve your life? It would make a huge difference if it was, you know, worked on. Um, at the moment, we spend so much time repeating ourselves to healthcare professionals, you know, coordinating appointments, um, going to different specialists and saying the same thing over and over again. And it, it just, you know, people living with rare diseases have enough on their plate as mm -hmm. it is. This is something that can really help them and just improve their quality of life. Well, best of luck with the campaign. Uh, Zainab and Kate, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. People living with rare diseases face huge challenges. There is the difficulty in getting a diagnosis and then the struggle to seek out an effective treatment if one exists. TMC Pharma Services works with companies to support the development of orphan drugs, which can help transform the lives of people around the world. Nestled in the heart of the Hampshire countryside, TMC Pharma helps biotech companies to bring orphan drugs to market. Drugs that can help people with conditions such as rare cancers, hereditary or metabolic diseases that only affect a tiny proportion of the population. The company was set up in 2000 by microbiologist Julie Matthews and her husband, a doctor. TMC now works with more than 300 medical research organisations in 70 countries across the globe, supporting them every step of the way in developing and bringing to market orphan drugs. It's hugely important that rare diseases are taken very seriously and they are beginning to be now. Often we'll find a new company will reach out to us because one of the company founders has a member of their family suffering from a rare disease and they want to get a treatment for them. So these people are championing a particular orphan disease and what TMC Pharma does is to help them through the process of developing that drug, doing all the tests that we need 
to show the authorities that it's safe and it works in the disease and getting it on the market so that that loved one can be treated in the future. Professor Mark Laudel has been treating patients with rare diseases for more than 30 years. The challenge for him and his team is designing the right trials for orphan drugs as opposed to drugs for much more prevalent diseases. Finding those patients, finding the centres of excellence, but more importantly designing the trial that gets you from never having treated a patient through to a drug that you can deliver as a commercial drug to treat these patients requires the expertise that companies like TMC have where they can identify the centres, they can help you design the trial to work with very small numbers of patients and that's not what conventional trial design normally does. Professor Daniel Gale treats patients with rare forms of kidney disease. We're working with TMC Pharma to deliver a clinical trial of a condition called Alport syndrome at the Royal Free Hospital. Alport syndrome is a devastating kidney disease that causes kidney failure typically early in life. At the moment there's no treatment that can stop kidney failure developing so it's very exciting to think that perhaps in the future we will be able to help these patients. In Europe, a disease is classed as an orphan when it affects fewer than 5 in 10,000 people. It's estimated that there are between 5 and 8,000 orphan diseases worldwide. 40% of the medicines approved by the European authorities in 2021 were to treat orphan diseases. TMC has a network of more than a thousand specialist associates around the world, all striving to help biotech companies to develop their drugs and ensure they're supported every step of the way, all with an end goal of improving prospects for those suffering with an orphan disease. Sometimes a, a, a drug for a rare disease will help but not completely cure the disease. Um, other times it will transform their lives. Uh, we worked with one product where small children were born with a, a defect in their metabolism which made their liver very uh, dysfunctional. Uh, they had to have liver transplants maybe at age 10 and, and, and lived a very short life. And one of the drugs I worked with um, was for that disease and children can now take one tablet a day and have a relatively normal life, which is amazing. Research like this offers the possibility of new treatments to prevent serious diseases from devastating lives. Oh, it's game changing because you couldn't do the trials without that expertise. I couldn't, on my own, off my own bat, design a clinical trial to, to work with a small number of patients. It's, it, it, the, the, these rare diseases require expertise which is, is, is very, very precise, very, very unique. Uh, and without it, you just wouldn't get the trial done. The heartbreaking thing for patients with rare diseases is that they feel that they're neglected. The term orphan suggests neglect. It's our job to turn that around and make those neglected groups feel looked after and that we're there to try and find treatments to make their lives better. Myasthenia gravis is a debilitating, rare autoimmune neuromuscular disorder that can affect each person differently, so every patient must be treated in an individual way. The Health Innovation Network received funding from biopharmaceutical company UCB that enabled them to deliver a report that uses information from a broad range of stakeholders to better understand the changes needed in rare disease healthcare services and to improve the lives of those living with the disease. Catherine Dale is the Programme Director of Health Innovation Network, an organisation which received vital funding to conduct a report into myasthenia gravis, a rare neuromuscular condition. The report was funded by UCB. As a pharma company, they knew that this was an area that wouldn't necessarily get um, the, the resources associated that it would need uh, to carry out this piece of work. Um, so they funded the work that it took to bring those people together to build a consensus and identify some areas where the services could be improved. 
Catherine and her team have played a key role in creating the report and believes that it can serve as a catalyst for change, not only helping those affected by myasthenia gravis, but also those suffering with other rare diseases. This report has a number of recommendations and it's really important because we've gathered these recommendations through consulting with a real range of people who are involved in myasthenia gravis. So we worked with doctors, consultants, GPs, um, nurse specialists, uh, patients, people with lived experience of myasthenia gravis. Their diseases are not common, but one in 17, that's 7% of the population, can be affected by one at some point of their lives, which is why reports such as the one conducted here on mass senior gravis can aim to shed light on what more needs to be done. And this couldn't be more helpful for people like 66-year-old Cormac Kelly, a patient who was diagnosed with the condition two years ago. I've had my senior gravis, in fact, I can remember the very day that things happened. So it was February the 13th, uh, 2021, during the second COVID pandemic, that I was sitting at a table talking on my mobile phone to my daughter when suddenly I felt I couldn't speak. My speech had gone a bit funny, as if I was drunk. Um, so I hung up quickly and then my wife looking at me said, you don't look well you're having a stroke. After calling 111, Cormac was taken to casualty and diagnosed with a mini stroke, but was transferred to a stroke unit where he received inconclusive results. I took it upon myself to ring one of my more intelligent friends, recently retired neurologist, who said, can you do a video of yourself before and after you're eating and send it to me, which I did sent it through email, he rang me at 10 o'clock at night time and said, look, Cormac, you, um, you almost certainly have myasthenia gravis. After blood test results came back positive from the doctors, Cormac's diagnosis of myasthenia gravis was then officially confirmed. I understood it was a rare disease and it was about why me, why did it hit me? Because I knew immediately this is going to affect my life and what I did, my relationships, and more importantly, my work as an orthopaedic surgeon. So, devastating diagnosis at that time. Patients with myasthenia gravis can often suffer with a range of symptoms, including droopy eyes, slurred speech, muscle weakness, double vision, and problems eating and drinking. I had very worrying daughters, everybody around me, watching me, waiting for something to happen. It's a feeling that Dr Jennifer Spillan understands as a consultant neurologist who has worked with patients with myasthenia gravis and other rare conditions. Hopefully this report and the actions that will come from it will allow um, increased um, our rapidity of diagnosis, so increase the speed of diagnosis. That came out as a major problem and something that I've encountered day to day clinically, that it takes a long time for patients to get a definite diagnosis. The other thing I hope it will bring about is increased awareness amongst healthcare professionals, not only neurologists, but A&E doctors, GPs, opticians, different healthcare professionals that people will encounter in the day to day environment. Dr Jennifer Spillan believes that there are existing support in place for those suffering with the condition that could be further expanded to help patients all over the UK. So one thing I would hope that would come from this report is the value of myasthenia gravis specialist nurses and that their number would increase throughout the country. Homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, or HOFH, is a rare hereditary disease and if left untreated can lead to premature heart disease. But outcomes can be improved with early identification and diagnosis. Pharmaceutical company Ultragenics supports initiatives to aid that all-important early detection and is committed to supporting people living with HOFH and their doctors and caregivers. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death worldwide. Often known as the silent killer, many people don't even know they have it. We often associate it with lifestyle and diet, but some forms of cardiovascular disease are genetic. 
One condition, called homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, is inherited from both parents. It causes dangerously high levels of cholesterol, and it's very rare. At the moment, experts believe there are upwards of 200 people in the UK currently with homozygous FH, but only around 70 of those have actually been diagnosed, so there's a real need to find and treat the rest. That's because, left untreated, the body is unable to remove cholesterol from the arteries, which get clogged up, predisposing people with homozygous FH to early onset cardiovascular disease. If it's not been picked up, occasionally it'll be, unfortunately, after they've had an event, so they've had their first heart attack or stroke, and then someone thinks, OK, why has this patient had a heart attack or stroke so early? And that's when their cholesterol levels are measured for the first time. Ultragenics specialises in discovering and developing therapies for people with rare and ultra-rare diseases. Creating therapies for diseases like homozygous FH, when only a few hundred people have it, presents its challenges. First, you have to identify them. You are trying to find a needle in a haystack. So as an industry, we certainly partner with patient associations and groups and physician groups to educate, to communicate, to create greater awareness. And really it's all about making sure if there are signs or symptoms that a light bulb goes on that you either test or you refer to a specialist centre um, and make sure that those patients get a, a timely diagnosis. And patients with homozygous FH, they can get um, lumps of cholesterol depositing under their skin, often sort of under their eyes here, or often as sort of lumps um, on their elbows. And so that sort of triggers their, their family doctor to think, you know, why have they got these lumps? Perhaps this is related to their cholesterol levels. The charity Heart UK wants a nationwide programme to screen all 18-month-olds to find every single patient before they get ill. Heart UK knows of a young lady who had to have a triple heart bypass at the age of 21. So this isn't normal, and this is exactly what homozygous does if you're not diagnosed at a very, very young age. And it's extremely costly to the NHS for somebody to have a triple heart bypass. And... It's, it's not just that, it's the heart attacks that are happening that also are extremely costly. And prevention is absolutely the name of the game here. We need to get in there early so we can prevent this because actually it is preventable. And we've got some really quite effective treatments to lower the cholesterol in these patients. So we just need to make sure that we make the diagnosis and, and get in there early. And that's the key. The sooner someone is diagnosed with homozygous FH, the greater their chance of effective treatment to live a fuller, healthier and happier life. Rare disease is a global health challenge. It requires organisations around the world to work together on solutions for patients. We spoke with the University of Oxford to discuss how they have partnered their expertise with that of others, with the goal of driving cutting-edge breakthroughs to meet the needs of those living with rare diseases. Ten-year-old Felix lives with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, it's a condition characterised by progressive muscle weakness. So, Felix, how are you doing? Great. Right. But because he has a gene mutation which can be treated, he's taking part in an early phase clinical trial. The fact that we've had another opportunity to have hope, that feels good, but, you know, it's only good for the family if the drug works. But we were discussing earlier today, weren't we, or was it yesterday, that for science, a fail is a win because then they know what not to do next time. Supporting trials like these is the Institute of Developmental and Regenerative Medicine at the University of Oxford. Its purpose-built laboratories are part of the university's much bigger biomedical research campus in the city one of the largest concentrations of biomedical expertise in the world. And it's through partnerships, both international and national, that the university is committed to using its expertise in research, in genomics and therapeutic development to make a real difference to people living with rare diseases. 
The Wellcome Center for Human Genetics, also based here, is an international leader in genetics, genomics and structural biology. We've come a huge way. So when I started in, in this field around 20 years ago, we were literally just able to sequence one gene at a time. We developed panels that allowed us to be able to sequence a few genes at the same time, which sped things up a little bit. But, but now the transformation from there to being able to offer whole genome sequencing to these patients and to find a diagnosis in a good proportion of them is, is fantastic. Finding a genetic diagnosis for everyone, though, and identifying novel, innovative treatments for potentially thousands of rare diseases continues to be the goal. And working with the Oxford Harrington Rare Disease Centre, it's hoped 20 new medicines can be developed for clinical trials over the next 10 years. You might think, well, that would be an immense achievement, but it's still a, a drop in the ocean if there are 10,000 of these diseases. So what we also hope is that we'll do more than 20 and that each one of these may have the possibility of being applied to more than one disease. And therefore in that way, our 20 could be amplified to benefit patients with potentially 100 of these diseases. And in the process, we'll learn how to do this quickly and cost effectively and make these drugs available across the globe to the patients who need them. And the Oxford Biomedical Research Centre's genomic medicine theme aims to bridge the gap between genomics researchers and clinicians diagnosing and treating patients. The beauty in Oxford is good collaboration and dialogue between the physicians, um, who will be the final users, uh, the, the clinical trialists, the preclinical developer in, in the, and the academic um, working at the, at the bench sites. And this happens in Oxford. This is something we can do in Oxford. This is something that, for which we now have all the pieces of the puzzle to make a successful story. A cure for Duchenne muscular dystrophy may still be an aspiration at this stage. But for Felix and his mum, any breakthrough which could delay the progression of his disease would be welcomed. I do feel like a centre like this really is shifting the needle in terms of what could be possible in the future, not only for a condition like Duchenne, but um, having such a, an amazing centre of research with such great resource and you know, really wonderful staff. It is not a drag for us to come and take part in something that could make a difference. On average, rare diseases are diagnosed up to seven years too late. And with diseases such as Fabry and Pompeii, a diagnosis can take even longer. Volv Global have developed an AI technology that can help close this diagnostic gap, accelerating a patient's access to treatment and improving the outcome of those living with a rare disease. Diagnosing a rare disease can be like finding a single snowflake in a snowstorm. For doctors and patients, the search for answers can be overwhelming. Many people living with a rare disease can go an average of seven years without knowing exactly what's wrong with them. Volve, a company based here in Switzerland, wants to help doctors reach a diagnosis much faster than that. Christopher Rudolph is the CEO of Volve, a company revolutionizing the way we screen for difficult to diagnose diseases. Doctors often don't understand the disease that they're trying to diagnose. They may have never heard of the disease, they may have never learnt about the disease at medical college, and so they're faced with a patient that they, they just don't know what's wrong with them, and therefore it's very difficult for them to diagnose correctly. Volve's artificial intelligence technology, called Intrigue, uses machine learning to flag people at risk of a rare, difficult to diagnose, or orphan disease. The system scans vast amounts of anonymized medical data, searching for clues that doctors might miss. The issue here is that the number of things that a doctor has to think about are way more than um, they actually can think about. So in a health record in the UK, you might have 150,000 different combinations of data with all the possible different medication codes, all the different symptom codes, etc. And the idea is they can get to this decision-making quicker to help um, 
take the patient to a diagnostic test or for a referral to a specialist. Volve's technology is being trialed in the UK, helping find people at risk of Fabry and Pompeii disease, two rare conditions that currently can take more than a decade to diagnose. This is the screen that doctor will see in the practice, and here it's highlighting how many patients in this practice have been flagged. And so it gives them a summary of all the patients that are at risk, and then how many patients don't have the disease, how many are already diagnosed, and how many are at risk of disease that could do with a diagnosis. An early warning means patients could begin potentially life-saving treatment as soon as possible. And healthcare systems like the NHS could save time and resources, especially as Volve hopes to provide the technology for free to medical providers. I think that this sort of technology could potentially be really useful. I think the massive advantage to it is that it can you can look at so many patients really really quickly which a human is just you know isn't going to be able to do you can apply this algorithm to potentially hundreds and thousands of of patients and then this is you know we're specifically only looking at two rare diseases at the moment but but there's you know it, there's sort of limitless potential with it Volv is also partnering with pharmaceutical companies with its program called Include to learn more about rare diseases themselves and better understand the number of people affected. Overall, the ability to actually get at the true size of the population of people living with any one rare disease is really critically important because if there's only a handful of people known to live with the disease. Maybe the, the entire investment to, uh, to pay attention to the disease or develop treatment options, do something about it, may be very marginal. So it changes the business incentive to develop treatment options. But what the technology won't change is the relationship between a patient and their doctor. The AI is very much there to help the clinician uh, find his or her way in the wealth of health information that is available already to them in the health records. And it's ultimately still to the clinician to pick that up with the patient, discuss it with the patient, and together decide whether or not you want to follow the approved diagnostic pathway. Volv hopes its technology will empower doctors to make informed healthcare decisions and potentially change the lives of anyone suffering from a rare disease. The reason we got into this is because we think it's the future of healthcare. We think it's actually a technology that can be applied across many different medical areas. So our work is not finished for a long time. So the more patients we can help uh, in terms of their lives, the, 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 the happier we are as an organization. Thank you for watching Together Caring for Rare Disease. We hope you enjoyed this program. From me and the team at ITN Business, goodbye.